Vakula. This venerable one's name means good bearing. In the past, throughout the limitless compass, he exclusively cultivated the precept against killing. His cultivation of that precept was not like that of us ordinary people at all. His mind did not even give rise to the thought of killing. Not only did he not kill outwardly, inwardly he was spotlessly clean in that he never killed a single living creature. Because of this, he received five kinds of non-dying retribution. When he was born, he was able to speak. He smiled and laughed and said, Mama and Papa, and was very playful. His mother thought, What on earth? I've never heard of a child who could talk and joke at birth. It must be a monster, since she was rather cruel and not compassionate. She put him in a frying pan and tried to fry him, but he wouldn't fry. It was as if nothing were happening. The pan was red hot, but Bakula was just as happy. All right, she said. You may be fireproof, but you're certainly not waterproof. And she tossed him in a pot of rapidly boiling water. But he still didn't die. Then she tried to drown him by holding him under water, but he couldn't be drowned. Do you think this is strange or not? She left him in the ocean and she was gulped down by a fish and he went right into the fish stomach, escaping the fish teeth. Just then, strangely enough, the fish was caught in a fisherman's net and the fisherman cut the fish open with a knife. Vakula was not harmed by the knife either and jumped right out of the fish belly. Thus, he received the five kinds of non-dying retribution. The fire didn't burn him. The water didn't boil him. The ocean didn't drown him. The fish didn't chomp him to death. And the fisherman's knife didn't cut him. He received these five as a response from his observance of the precept against killing and among the Buddha's disciples, he was the foremost in longevity. Mahakaustila The venerable Kaustila's name means big knees because big knees were a family trait. This venerable one was Shariputra's maternal uncle. As previously related, he made a bet with the Buddha that if he lost in debate, he would cut off his head. He was a gifted and eloquent debater. He was one of the Buddha's constant followers and the foremost disciple noted for eloquence. Nanda Here are three disciples of the name of, with the name of Nanda. Nanda, Ananda and Sudarananda. Nanda is known as Nanda the cowherd because he watched the cows when he was late. Nanda's name means wholesome bliss. As a cowherd, he heard the Buddha speak the, the 11 matters of tending cows, using the tending of cows as an analogy for cultivation of the way. Nanda, realizing that the Buddha was possessed of all knowledge, resolved to leave home and soon attained the fruition of a hardship. On one occasion, the Buddha instructed Nanda to preach to a group of 500 Bishunis. Hearing him speak, they all attained a hardship. In the past, the 500 Bishunis had been the concubines of a single king. The king, a great Dharma protector, built a large uh, pagoda in honor of a Buddha. The concubines believed in the Buddha and made offerings at the pagoda, vowing that in the future they would all obtain liberation with the king. The king was a former incarnation of Nanda. Sudarananda Sudarananda was named after his wife, Sundari. Sundari means good at loving. Whom does she love? Nanda, Sudarananda. 
Her name also means attractive because she absolutely stunning. He, it could be said that she was the most beautiful woman in all of India. Sundarananda was so beguiled by her beauty that he never left her side. It was as if they were magnetized or glued together. Walking, standing, sitting, and reclining, they were an inseparable couple. Shakyamuni Buddha wanted him to leave home. Sundarananda was the Buddha's younger brother. When the Buddha saw that his causal affinities were mature enough that he could leave home, he also knew that Sundarananda couldn't give up his wife to do it. Thus, the Buddha decided to apply an expedient measure. One day, when Sundarananda and his wife were eating lunch, he went to the palace to beg for arms. When Sundarananda saw his older brother, he wanted to offer him some food, but the Buddha said, Take it to the Jetta Grove. How can I do that? said Sundarananda. How can I leave my wife home alone? He didn't dare contradict his brother's orders, so he asked his wife. The Buddha said, I should take the food to the Jetta Grove. Is it all right if I go? Yes, and one, uh, on one condition, she said. I am going to spit on the floor. You must return before that spit is dry. Otherwise, you needn't bother coming in the door because I won't let you in. All right, said Sundarananda, thinking he would easily make it back in time. But when he arrived, the Buddha wouldn't let him go. He ordered him to shave his head and leave home. Sundarananda spent all day trying to figure out a way to sneak back home to see his wife because he simply couldn't let her go. One day, all the bishops went out to beg, and Shakyamuni Buddha told Sundarananda, Stay here today and watch the door. You're not going anywhere today. Sweep the floor and clean the place up. We are going out to beg and we'll bring some food back for you. Sundarananda was ecstatic. Finally, a chance to escape, he thought. He planned to sweep the floor, wash the windows, and run. Strangely enough, as soon as he got one end of the hole swept, dirt would collect on the other side. He swept all morning until he was perspiring, perspiring with the exhaustion, but he still couldn't get the floor clean. As soon as he closed one window, another would blow open and the sweepings would fly around the room. Then when he shut that window, yet another would fly open. He was getting more and more frustrated later it got. The morning was sleeping away. The Buddha would return soon and he would have missed his chance. Finally, in desperation, he ran. He knew if he met the Buddha, he would have to return to the Jetta Grove. He also knew that the Buddha always traveled by the main roads, and so he took a side road and who do you think he ran into? The Buddha. He was returning from his arms route. Sundarananda jumped behind a big tree and as he backed around the tree, the Buddha followed him. He would reverse his direction and the Buddha would do so as well. Finally, they met face to face and the Buddha said, What are you doing? I waited for you until I couldn't wait anymore, said Sundarananda. I decided to come and escort you back to the Jetta Grove. Good, said the Buddha. Let's go back. Since he had no other choice, he returned with the Buddha and after he had eaten lunch, the Buddha asked, him. Would you like to go out sightseeing with me today? I take you out to play. Sundarananda thought, I don't have the heart to go play. I'm only concerned with running home. I really don't have the spirit, but if the Buddha wants me to go, I can't refuse. And he forced himself. They went to a mountain where there were a lot of monkeys. The Buddha asked him, Tell me which is more beautiful, Sundari or these monkeys, 
Why? Of course, my wife is more beautiful. How can you compare these ugly monkeys with my wife? What an insult! The Buddha said, "You are truly intelligent. You can tell the good from the bad." Now let's return. By now, Sudarananda was obsessed with thoughts of his wife. Several days passed, and no opportunity to run away presented itself. The Buddha said to him, "You seem so desperately pressed every day. I can't imagine what's on your mind. Let me take you up to the heavens for a look around. I wonder what the heavens are like." Thought Sudarananda. They ascended into the heavens, and they saw a lovely heavenly palace filled with exquisite heavenly maidens. The Buddha said. Who do you say is more beautiful, the maidens or Sundari? The heavenly maidens, said Sundarananda. Compared to these goddesses, Sundari looks like a monkey. There's no comparison. As they went on their way, Sundarananda lagged behind and stole a word with one of them. Who is your master? He asked. Our master is the Buddha's little brother, Sundarananda. He has now left home under the Buddha and cultivates the way. Next life, he will be reborn in heaven and grow to be his attendant. Delighted at the prospect, Sundarananda resolved to cultivate, forgetting all about Sundari and thinking only of goodnesses, goodnesses. He cultivated to be reborn in the heavens. When he had cultivated for a long time, the Buddha, seeing that he was no longer thinking of Sundari, but only of the maidens, thought, "I think I'll show him something unusual." Sundarananda, he said, "You've been to the heavens, but you've never seen the hells. Would you like to accompany me there?" Since the Buddha thought that the hells were most unpleasant, Sundarananda wondered what would be the use of going there. But agreeing to go and take a look, he followed the Buddha there. They saw the hells of the mountains of knives, the hell of sweet trees, the hell of boiling oil, the hell of fire soup, all the hells. In one of the hells, he saw a spot of oil. That was barely simmering. Two ghosts who were supposedly tending it were nodding off, and the fire was on the verge of going out. One of the ghosts, in fact, was even lying down sound asleep. Two truly lazy ghosts neglecting the pot for their nap. Sundarananda asked, "Hey, old friend, who's your boss? How can you get away with sleeping on the job?" The ghost yawned and rubbed his eyes. "What's that you say?" he replied. "I said I want to know why you are laughing on the job." Sundarananda said, "Pots of oil have to boil, you know." "What do you know?" asked the ghost. "The person destined to undergo punishment in this spot isn't due here for a long time." "What do you mean?" asked Sundarananda. The Buddha's little brother Sundarananda has already left home under the Buddha. He cultivates the blessings of the heavens, and in the future will be reborn there. When he has used up his heavenly blessings, the five signs of decay will manifest. They will. He will then fall into the hells to be buried in this very pot of oil, because he did not cultivate the way properly. He still. Got several hundred years, however. So why should we busy ourselves boiling the oil now? Our jobs are quite soft. We can sleep all day if we like. When he heard this, Sundarananda's entire body broke out in a cold sweat. That pot intended for me, he mourned. What am I going to do? The Buddha took Sundarananda back to the Jetta Grove and spoke to him. Of the Dharma Jar that birth in the heavens is bound up with suffering, emptiness, impermanence, and non-self. He cultivated the Buddha Dharma and certified to the fruit of a hardship. 
Sundarananda was hopelessly in love with his wife, and yet he fell out of love as soon as he saw women more beautiful than her. Then, because he saw the sufferings in the house, he decided truly to cultivate the way, something he never would have done otherwise. The name Nanda also means bliss, but this Nanda is different from the one discussed previously. He takes his name from his wife Sundari because he was Sundari's Nanda.